another big round of applause, shall we? Well, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon, or this morning, isn't it? I did wonder why I was traveling up yesterday, hours and hours and hours from deep southern England, but I knew that God must have something planned. And then I came in here this morning, and you know, I thought, wow! God's glory is here. And it's so good to be in the presence of his glory. And it's a real honor and a joy to be here at Southport. Now, when I came to Southport, they said, you feel very at home in Southport being in a wheelchair because it's Costa Geriatrica. <laughs> uh, and all these old people. <laughs> and now they told me there'd be other wheelchairs here. There's only yours. <laughs> I, f I feel I'm being underrepresented by the community. I really thought that this was going to be wheelchair man. They said, you haven't got to worry about getting knocked over by a car. You'll just be run over by a wheelchair. <laughs> I thought, fine. Now, most of you don't know who I am. Let me start by praying, okay? In Aramaic, you don't understand it, but Jesus did. He spoke in it. So, Shimid Baba, Brona, Brocha, Kosha, Halacha, Halachumaana, Amen. The blessing of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. For the Lord is here, and his Spirit is with us. So we're going to expect big things by God. Are you his wife? Hello, what's your name? Georgie, Georgie can I shake your hand? Hi, Georgie, lovely to meet you. I just don't quite know everybody yet, so I want to get to know people. Don't I, Georgie? <laughs> yeah. Now, I might be... No, leave it. It's right. I might be the vicar of Baghdad, which means I'm kind of Anglican. But I promised you I'm not boring. <laughs> you know, a lot of Anglicans are really, really, really boring. <laughs> you know, I... I didn't start my life as a clergyman. I started my life as a gas man. Not the kind who did pipes and machines, the kind that puts you to sleep. <laughs> so then I ran the cardiac arrest team, so I was more into bringing people to life. And I thought, I like this resurrection business. So. I said to God one day when I was standing at my hospital in London, I love working for you here so much. And then God said, ask what next? I said, what next? He said, I want you to go into the church. I said, they're not even all saved in the church. And God said, I know that, that's why you're going. I said, you don't mean the Church of England, do you? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, they're really not saved. He said, oh, look, that's why you're going. <laughs> so I went. And I used to be a clergyman in London, and then I was a clergyman in Coventry Cathedral. And then I was literally sent from Coventry to Baghdad. <laughs> and it was the most wonderful time of my life. 
I never thought I would be as happy again doing church things as when I was running the cardiac arrest team. But there in Baghdad, I had a miraculous time. I saw Jesus. I mean, not once or twice, you know, like people say, I had a vision of Jesus one day. No, we saw him every day. If you buy my books, you can see him. <laughs> if you don't, you can't. Never mind. <laughs> and um, we had incredible resurrections and incredible glory. The place I used to hang out all the time, my favorite place, I've never been into visiting holy shrines. But there was one in a place called El Kippel, which means of Yeheskil, which means Ezekiel's place. And Ezekiel was down the road from me in Babylon. And I went there one day. And wow, you read about the spinning wheels in Ezekiel. And there I was by his shrine, by his tomb. And there were wheels in the air going round and round. And I saw angels. And I saw the glory of God like I'd never seen before. And that was really the supernatural ministry that God got me into. Now, I wasn't, um, I wasn't brought up an Anglican. I was reared a Pentecostal. Now, will you forgive me? <laughs> I was AOG. <laughs> I was from the other lot. <laughs> but, when I went and did my obstetric anesthetics in Derby, I became Elim. <laughs> so I'm an Anglican with Elim leanings. <laughs> and my grandfather used to work for a guy who you may have heard of. And this is his Bible. It's falling to pieces. Smith Wigglesworth. This is his actual Bible. Every sentence is underlined. And there he is in the Bible. And his sermon notes are in here as well. If you buy a book, you can see it. A fairly good deal. Now... I want to talk tonight a little about the persecution of our church. Our people, I had a church which, when I started it, we had nobody. The only people who started coming were all the spooks, head of the CIA, the FBI, MI5, they just happened to be in Baghdad looking for Saddam. You know, as they do. <laughs> I've actually got the pen that signed Saddam's death sentence. I usually sign my books with it. <laughs> <laughs> but today I haven't got it. Because my colleague and I forgot to bring it. <laughs> I've got some other green pens. <laughs> got some other green pens. But um, where, where are my pens? My... Oh, I have got some other pens. Would somebody like one of my pens? First one here gets it. <laughs> I 
It's quite good that Jesus is the light of the world, and so are my pens. Here we are, Pastor. <laughs> so I was brought up in the Pentecostal church, and um, it was God who threw me into the Anglican church. And that really opened so many doors because, you know, the established church, the established church has kind of links with... I was looking through this book of mine, which you can buy afterwards. <laughs> and there's a picture of me with Pope John Paul, picture of me with all the Ayatollahs, picture with the Yasser Arafat, a picture of me with Saddam's people, with John Major, with Tony Blair, with all of them. But it's incredible how God has used my life as a nobody. I did not come from a very wealthy, influential family. My father did, but I was brought up by a fairly poor family. My father was thrown out of his family because he was Anglo-Indian, and they were quite wealthy, but they didn't want my father marrying an English person. So my father married an English person, the one whose father worked for Smith Wigglesworth, and um, I was told when I was little, I always said, when I was a little boy, I was asked at school by my teacher when I was nine, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said two things. Nine-year-olds usually want to be a football player. I wanted to be an anaesthetist and a priest. So I told my teacher I want to be an anaesthetist and a priest. She said, you can only do one thing. And she said, you can't be a priest anyway because you're a Pentecostal and they don't have priests. God can work at that one. <laughs> God sorted that one out. So... I had a very interesting life. I got into the church. I went off to Cambridge and I read theology. And to be honest with you, it was really, really boring. <laughs> Christian theology is really, really boring. So I gave it up and did Judaism. <laughs> so I did my second doctorate was in the role of Israel and Christian theology. And my third one is Yiddish, so you all understand that. The role of the Baal Shem Tov in the Haskalah. Does anybody understand that? <laughs> no. It's funny that, isn't it? <clears throat> I was looking... <laughs> Looking at this book, The Vicar of Baghdad, which you can buy after. <laughs> and there's a picture of me there. And I'm sitting on a very comfortable chair. Better than the wheelchair. It was covered in gold and well padded. It used to be Saddam's throne. But he didn't need it anymore. <laughs> so they gave it to me. <laughs> I was chaplain of the coalition in Iraq. And so Saddam's palace became our headquarters. So I lived in there. <laughs> and I sat on there. And it's quite interesting because behind my preaching chair were Scud missiles going through the air. 
It's quite interesting having pictures of Scud missiles behind your throne. You can get the book later <laughs> and see the picture. Anyway, one day I was at an airport in Washington, in Dallas, and God said to me, speak to that woman. And I said, no. And he said again, tell that woman good morning. I said, I'm British. I don't go around to everybody saying, hi, have a nice day. And God said again, talk to that woman. He didn't just tell me to talk to that woman. He told me to tell this woman, who is an African-American lady, in her 60s, he said, tell her to call the child Rivka. I said, she's got no child. So I did eventually say, good morning, madam. Have you thought of calling the child Rivka? Which is Rebecca in Arabic. And she said, who are you? I said, I'm just a pastor. She said, how do you know I'm going to name my granddaughter? I said, call her Rivka. So she phoned her daughter and said, I've just met a pastor in the airport. And he said, call your daughter Rivka. She said to her mother, who is he? She said, I don't know. She said, let me talk to him. So I said, good morning, my dear. How are you? I knew she was in labor, so not very well. <laughs> she said to me, her daughter said to me, that's Abuna Andrew. I said, how do you know who I am? And how do you know I'm called it in Arabic? She said, you were my pastor. I was two years in the army in Baghdad. And you were our pastor. And she said, I can't believe this. And that was a wonderful example of always needing to hear what God is saying to you. Often God talks to me and says, pray for that person. Anoint that person. I was in Bristol a few weeks ago. And it was a time which was a service of different churches, not in a church. And I felt God say, pray for people. So I anointed people. And it wasn't long before there was a lady who was in a wheelchair like me. And she kicked her wheelchair to the end of the room. And she was dancing around in circles. God had healed her. And I said to God, why her, not me? I want to be dancing around the room. And Esther, my assistant, said to me, that what God has done through you he will do to you. So I'm just waiting. Not much longer. I used to come to Liverpool because one of the people you talked about this morning, Sally, 
Her husband, Dr. Khalid, he is a very good rheumatologist. And I had a terrible shoulder. And the only doctor who could ever treat it was his friend. So I used to come up here and he'd inject it under ultrasound and put steroids in. And it worked. And then a few weeks ago, this person again, Esther, who's a friend of Sharon. Where is Sharon? Hi, Sharon. I hear you went to the best school. But she doesn't think it's the best anymore. And I'm the president of it. So it has to be good. So, we prayed for these people and they got healed. And then we were in Ordinary the other day and I prayed for a little boy and he had terrible eczema and the next morning he was healed. We were doing a summer camp, camp or a winter camp or a holiday camp. And then I had this terrible shoulder, which I told you about, that I used to come get treated here. And then Esther prayed for me, and I got healed like that. I mean, this pain was so terrible. The fact that I've got MS and can't walk is nothing compared to my arm. She prayed for me there and then pain gone. The thing is that God has shown me is that God used to, wants to use all of us miraculously. And God wants to heal through us and by us. God wants to heal you today. And whenever I'm talking about healing, God always tells me that there are people he wants to heal. There's people with eye problems, retinal problems, but somebody with a very unusual retinal condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Who's got a retinal condition here? Where's my anointing oil? Is it in the bag? Can I come pray for you now? You don't mind if I don't do things as normal? Right, let me pray for you, my friend. This is good anointing oil. It's called Esther anointing oil <laughs> from Jerusalem. It really is. What's your name? Liz. Liz. Liz, may I bless you in the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Liz, may the healing power of Jesus come into you now. Liz, may the fragrance of this Esther oil bring you peace, healing, and wholeness. Not in a year to come. Now, Lord, come now. Amen. Next one, please. What's wrong with you? Glaucoma. Glaucoma. May the Lord... Bless you, heal you, restore your retina and your humerus and your optical nerve. Heal you now, Lord. Next one. <laughs> What's wrong? Well, I thought it was only retinitis, but I have cornea scarring, front and back of eye. And you have retinitis. I don't know what I've got. Else. You've got 
three what things. I'm here, what I'm to pray for. <laughs> Lord, heal these three things. What's your name? Noreen. Noreen, be healed in Jesus' name. Now, all of you, be healed. That does tend to happen when you pray for people. But hopefully, God's into resurrection, so he'll get you up. You're stronger than you know. <laughs> and so... And so, in our church, a church which had six and a half thousand people, over 270 were killed because they loved Jesus. This is what happens to so many people who follow Jesus in dangerous places. The church, and I want to talk about this tonight, do you know there are more Christians persecuted today than ever in history? We are living amongst a persecuted church. I have a school of children, several hundred children in Jordan, all of them have fled from Iraq because they were going to be killed. And yet they have seen miracles. The children have seen miracles. But the children really give. One of our little girls, Mariam, she had lovely long hair. All of our children had lovely long hair. And the other day, Miriam had had all of her hair cut. And I said, Miriam, what's happened to your hair? She said, Jasmine got cancer. And she was having treatment, and it made all her hair fall out. So I cut, I had all my hair cut so that it could be made into a wig for Miriam. Miriam has now got my hair. There's a little girl giving her everything, giving her hair. Can't we give? You are so privileged to be part of such a glorious church. I came in here this morning and I could sense the supernatural presence of God. Your pastor, can I be honest with you? I love your pastor. <laughs> he is such an incredible man. What a gift of God to have a pastor like that. It is such an honor. And I can see that your people are eating from you. They're receiving from you. And the Lord wants to bring healing and the wholeness here. Who's got fibromyalgia? God is saying there are two people here this morning with fibromyalgia. And he is saying he wants to touch your pain. Who is it? One. Two. Two. I, after the service, I want to anoint you and pray that God will bring healing and wholeness to you. Our Lord is a God of restoration. All the time, we talk about needing miracles of healing. 
There are lots of other miracles which are needed. I need miracles. Not just to walk again. I need a miracle to get back to the Middle East. I literally don't have the money, but God has it. In a week's time, I will be ready to go back. I have no ability. God does. And there are those of you here, maybe you're not sure what job you're supposed to be doing. But God knows. And God says to you today, I have chosen the way you should go. And he says to you, this is the way, walk in it. Walk in that way and show that you are following after Jesus. Amongst our children in Iraq, I used to teach them to sing, mainly in Arabic. But we used to sing a few songs in English. And all the songs tended to be my childhood songs. So we used to sing songs that you all know, like, In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of heavenly harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. sweetest name I know. Every longing keeps me singing as I go. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of heavenly harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. There were other songs we used to sing as well. And I used to love these songs. And it's good to be with people who will know how to sing them properly. <laughs> oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus washed my entire way. He told me how. To watch and pray, and hear rejoicing every day. Hallelujah, happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. When did you last sing that? <laughs> but my favorite song. <laughs> was Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little one to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Who was the worship leader earlier? When did you last sing, Yes, Jesus loves me? <laughs> you don't think you ever have. But we have because we're old. <laughs> we're old. It's lovely. What a wonderful church to be in. And my little children, 
They all wear bow ties because a boona wears a bow tie. And tonight we'll show you the picture of our school. And our uniform is a red bow tie. Is it red or maroon? Maroon bow tie. And all the children have a wooden cross. And I gave these children all a wooden cross. And I said, this is made by my friend in Bethlehem. He's a carpenter. And do you know what my friend is called? He's called Joseph. <laughs> so we have crosses by Joseph in Bethlehem. And when I was going away from school a few months ago, one of the little, I asked the children, what is Jesus saying to you? And have you all got your crosses? And one little boy had cried because he wanted to cross for his daddy. And Ash at the terrace, I said to kill his daddy. So I gave him a cross and put it on the altar. And I said, one day your daddy will get that cross. And when I went there a few months ago, he said, will you take this cross and give it to the church where you're going? So this is his cross. Hosea, I want you to have his cross. Will you take Joseph's cross? And we know that the Lord is here with all of you. And his cross is here with you. And his cross means everything. His cross, I know it all sounds a bit much, but basically, you know, they say things like, you've just got to be saved. Well, what does that mean? You've got to be saved from where we're all going. No hope for any of us. Jesus says, come to me and you can become part of my family. Come to me and I will give you life forever. Come to me, and even though you might not know what's happening or what you're doing, Jesus says, I will give you life in all of its fullness. You will live more than you've ever lived before. Jesus says, this morning, here in this lovely town of Southport, Lancashire, where people have wheelchairs, where the old people live, Jesus says, you can come and have life. And I'm in here today, and I'm experiencing life. Jesus loves you, this you know, for the Bible tells me so. There are some people here today who might not know what their future is. Jesus says, come to me. I want you now. Who wants Jesus now and hasn't had him before? Anybody want to become a Christian? Anybody want to follow Jesus? And I promise you, it is not boring. <laughs> like most of the churches I go to. It's not boring. It's about life. And Jesus wants you to come into life with him. And he wants you to come into fullness and healing with him. 
Tonight, I will tell you a lot more about all the suffering of our church and our people. It's a wonderful story because what we know is out of desperation and out of persecution comes real life and real meaning and real fullness. Yes, I might have a church in the most dangerous place in the world, but it's the most wonderful church. It's the most glorious church. And it's the most happy. Apart from Southport, <laughs> I think we've got the most happy. But my little experience of being here with you today shows that you're really full of joy as well. And God loves you. And he wants you. There are lots of people from different countries here. Now, I always get told off for asking what countries are represented here. But I was so pleased to meet Hosea, who is from Nigeria, because I spent a lot of time in Nigeria. And you even knew my town, Kaduna, didn't you? You got married in Kaduna. Are you a Kaduna bride? <laughs> oh! Well, well, well. What other countries are people here from? Jordan, Jordan you're one of us. <laughs> so only Jordanian and Nigerian. Africa. Zambia. Zambia. South, Africa. South Africa. Who's from South Africa? I want some Mrs. Balls Chutney. I do, seriously. <laughs> Mrs. Ball's Chutney. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, if one of my friends is Iranian, that means you must be like me, because I'm a Shia Masihi. All my friends are Shia. And what people say about Shia being all radical, dangerous, and evil is not true. My Ayatollah, my Saidna, he loves Jesus. But most of them don't. So, it's good to be amongst my own clan. <laughs> are you a Shia Masihi? You are? Yes! Now, the one thing I said to Esther, she said, you know, my friend is married to a Persian. I said, well, he must be like me, a Shia Masihi. So, so, I come here bringing this cross, which is the cross of Jesus, the life of Jesus. And he gives that life to all of us. And we rejoice in that life. And I rejoice in your wonderful church of glory. Your church of holiness. Your church of power. And tonight we're going to see great things happen. And I want to pray for healing for those who I have not prayed for. There are lots of other illnesses, not just bad eyes. There are lots of people with spinal problems. There are people, I prayed for the people, fibromyalgia. There are people who have got serious spinal pain. And the Lord is saying he's going to come into that and bring healing. There are lots of people with serious arthritic conditions. 
And not just me, but your healing praying team will pray as well. We pray that God will bring healing and anointing and restoration. And if you're really, really fortunate, I might get my friend Hosea to pray for you. <laughs> but first of all, I want Hosea to pray for me. Come on, Hosea. There's my anointing oil. Pray for my brother. The Lord is here. And wherever he is, his power is there as well, including healing power. And Father, we are all agreed in the spirit of Christ. I would pray for my brother here that he be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's all going to happen now. So I'm going to hand back to Pastor because my time is up now. But we will pray for you, won't we? Pastor, would you like your microphone back? <laughs> Just an absolute privilege, isn't it, to have to have Andrew. How many of you are going to be here this evening? <laughs> really want to encourage you to, to come along. And again, I'd say come early. We are going to be starting at six. Normally we have the drinks, the refreshments beforehand, but we are going to be starting at six. We want to give Andrew plenty of time to share. We're going to have some Q&A, uh, maybe even some more so, um, opportunity to pray for people for healing tonight as well. But the band are going to lead us in another song. And uh, if you need prayer. I know there's those two with fibromyalgia that Andrew said he wants to pray for, but he wants to stay and, 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 and pray for others as well. So maybe just as the, the band uh, are leading us, if you're one of those people or you'd like Andrew to pray for you, I, I just want to encourage you. Let, let, let's do it audibly, um, orderly rather, as we can. To just try and make a line for Andrew and uh, to, to come and be prayed for, to be anointed with oil. But uh, why don't we stand to 